everyone, and welcome to another episode of Who Ate It First. You stole my intro. I did. You can finish it, though. You already started. Might as well skip. I don't have the rest of it written down, so that's all I got. You're going to have to take uh, it from here. A food history <laughs> podcast with a twist. I'm Kendall Runquist. And I'm Logan Runquist. And it has been delicious. Oh, wait, no. Wait, what? <laughs> we didn't eat anything we're not, yet. We're not at the end already? It's not made yet. <laughs> oh. oh, yeah, we have a whole podcast to do. <laughs> it's literally not done. <laughs> the thing we're doing is literally not done yet. How are you? Doing fine. How are you? Good. That's good. So what are we uh, covering today? Well, since time seems to be going by really quickly this year, I think Easter is early. I don't really know what's happening. But time seems to be going by really fast because we're already at another holiday special. We're talking about Mardi Gras. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it is going fast. Yeah. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of Mardi Gras kind of as a whole, but mostly as it pertains to New Orleans specifically. And also one of the special dishes that you eat in New Orleans during Mardi Gras, which is king cake. Mm. You know, I've never actually had king cake before. Good, because this will ruin you for all other king cakes. (laughs) (laughs) It kind of sounds like I'm saying kinks, but I'm not. I'm saying king cake. (laughs) Just to (laughs) enunciate a little. So anyway, I'm going to jump right in. So in New Orleans, they have a phrase. It's pretty much equally translated to English where they say, Laissez le bon temps rouler, which means let the good times roll, quite literally translated. So that just means like uh, have a good time or like just be having a good time, be happy, because that's kind of the spirit of Mardi Gras, right? If you've ever seen Mardi Gras on TV or in movies, it's all about party, 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 right? So my sources for all of the information today are from the New Orleans Mardi Gras website, History.com, and I had a couple others, but I don't remember, but it's fine. (laughs) So I'm going to pronounce Mardi Gras correctly one time, just so that you know how to pronounce it. I'm not going to do it the whole time. It's too hard for my brain to flip between the two. So Mardi Gras translate like Mardi is Tuesday and Gras is fat. So fat Tuesday. Mm. Uh, That's That's like the French version of saying that? Well, the, the term Mardi Gras... Right. Wait, I'm sorry. Are you asking about the pronunciation? Yeah. Yeah. Mardi Gras is. It's French. how you say it in yeah. French. Yeah. But we just call it Mardi Gras. Right. Yeah. Because most people can't say it that way. I can't even say it the correct way. Yeah. Okay. Lady recorded her saying it for me, and I listened to it 12 times, and I can't even say it right. <laughs> I don't have the <laughs> accent, you know. But if you were, if you had the accent, it would be Mardi Gras. So that translates directly to Fat Tuesday. And today corresponds of the practice of indulging in your particular vice that you traditionally give up for the season of Lent in Catholic or Christian countries. Traditionally, in the days leading up to Lent, merrymakers would binge on all the rich fatty foods like meat, eggs, milk, lard, and cheese that remained in their homes in anticipation of several weeks of eating only fish and different types of fasting. So they were literally like, we're not going to be able to keep all of this. Let's just eat it because they didn't have any refrigeration. Mm. So because Lent is a time of penance and giving up all these all these things in like Catholic countries, because Catholicism is the one where you give up meat. Mm -hmm. And so you can only have fish during Lent. So they were literally like, it's not going to keep. Let's eat it all. So that let's makes me binge, laugh, baby. Exactly. Let's let's just let's just eat it all. I don't know. That makes me laugh. Can you imagine if people did that today? They'd be like, "Oh yeah, I have eighteen blocks of cheese in my house. We're gonna go eat all of that before tomorrow." Okay, bye. I feel triggered because that was me. Like, <laughs> we actually have a whole bunch of cheese from your charcuterie board. So, but not that much. I'm a little triggered. It's not that much cheese. <laughs> it's enough for two people. But anyway, imagine a big family, a a family of like 11, and you have all this milk, all this butter, cheese, meat. What are you going to do? Cook it all and eat it all. What you're going to do is you're going to eat it all and then spend the next three days in the bathroom, baby. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Exactly. 
Exactly. So going back even further in pagan traditions, this time of sort of consuming all of your all of your favorite foods and doing all of your favorite vices is tied back to the festivals of Lupercalia that we discussed last week, as well as Saturnalia, which is also worshiping the god Saturn. And so Lent as a whole marks the day before Ash Wednesday, the official start of Lent. And if you don't know, that is defined as a period of fasting for 40 days in advance of Easter. The modern American Mardi Gras, a.k.a. carnival season, officially begins on January 6th or 12th night, also known to Christians as Epiphany. The word Epiphany comes from the Greek verb that means to show. Therefore, it pays tribute to the Catholic belief that Jesus first showed himself to the three wise men and to the larger world on this day specifically. So I like history and I like to define things. I had one other one that I thought was really interesting. Do you know why they call it Carnival, besides the fact that it's just a party? No. It's because it derives from a feasting tradition in medieval Latin, Carnivalarium, which means to take away or remove meat, like carne, carneum, meat, carne, meat, Mm -hmm. Spanish for meat, carne. So it's called that because they're eating all of it before the next day. Uh Uh-huh. Isn't that crazy? That is crazy. So the word Carne valerium means to take away or remove meat. So the day before of carnival is eat it all. <laughs> Jaffiel. Jaffiel. Is that wild? That is wild. So the origin of Mardi Gras can be traced to medieval Europe passing through Rome in Venice in the 17th and 18th centuries uh, to the French house of the Bourbons or Bourbon is probably how you pronounce that. From here, the traditional rivalry of bouffe gras, or fatted calf, spread through France into her colonies. Just another definition of, you know, kill the fatted calf, it's a phrase. So you like, it's like having a party. Mm. Kill the fatted calf. Gotcha. Anyway. On March 2nd of 1699, French-Canadian explorer Jean-Baptiste de la Moine sur de Bonville arrived at a plot of ground 60 miles directly south of New Orleans, and named it Pointe du Mardi Gras, where his men realized it was the eve of the festive holiday. Bionville also established Fort Louis de la Louisienne, which is now mobile or mobile. I don't know how you pronounce it (laughs) in English. In 1702. In 1703, the tiny settlement of Fort Louis de la Mobile celebrated America's very first Mardi Gras. They also, at that same time, In Mobile, they established a secret society similar to those that currently perform the Mardi Gras. They're called Cruise with a K. I don't know if you know that, but there's it's a really prestigious honor to be part of a Mardi Gras crew. And that's kind of who puts on various floats in New Orleans. I think I worked with a guy that was in one of those. Seriously? He would go to New Orleans every year and he would ride the floats because I think he also helped yeah. build the floats. Yeah. Yeah. That it's that's like a big deal. If you're yeah. part of a crew, that's like a big deal. He was obsessed with New Orleans. I think he used to live there. Oh my gosh. Uh, but yeah, he loved he would go back every year for Mardi Gras. That's amazing. Okay, sidebar. I was just there last year and everybody that we met that was from New Orleans is literally obsessed with New Orleans. I have never met people so excited to like I'm from New Orleans and I live here and I love it and you should live here too because it's great. I've never like... Experienced that? Yeah. I mean like you do in some... Or some people will be like, oh, you know, Dallas is fine, comma, but. There's normally a but after that. Mm -hmm. And they're just like literally no buts. We love living in New Orleans. We love everything about it. So I'm sorry. I needed to just get that out. Yes. (laughs) So this was kind of where the first float came in. The Bouffe Gras Society that I mentioned earlier paraded through the town of Mobile. And the procession was held with a huge bull's head pushed along on wheels by 16 men. Later, they would parade with an actual bull draped in white. And so all of this was to signal through the town that the Lenten meat feast was coming. Like, here's your cow. Here it comes. Let's eat this bowl. Let's eat this gigantic thing because tomorrow 
can't have it no more. So just eat it all. <laughs> Can you imagine just like seeing somebody pulling a giant cow down our street? Anyway. <laughs> By the late 1830s, New Orleans held street processions of maskers with carriages and horseback riders, and this was to more fully celebrate the Mardi Gras season. Dazzling gaslight torches or flambeau lit the way for the crews, with the spelled with K, members, and they elicited an exciting air of romance and festivity, unquote. (laughs) So that is pretty much all I have on the history of Mardi Gras. But fun fact, other countries celebrate Mardi Gras or the season of Carnival also, like Spain, Germany, Italy, and others. If you went to Universal Theme Park right now in Florida, you'd most likely hit the Mardi Gras period. You can actually go between January and February. You'd hit the Mardi Gras period where they have tons of parties, tons of parades, floats, just all kinds of things, but they have specific booths for countries like Epcot does. And you can, in in this case, it's Mardi Gras specific food. And so you can go to Germany and taste what they have. And you can go to all the booths and and do what you do at Epcot. So I thought that was really cool. a lot of good Mardi Gras, like Cajun food. Yeah, but all different kinds of stuff. So shout out to Mammoth Club on YouTube. They did an entire segment on Mardi Gras Universal. Uh, if you're interested in that, I'm I'm just thinking back to like when I went to Italy, they they don't have king cake, but they do carnival with masks and food and everything is just like opulent and beautiful. And I love seeing how other cultures do Mardi Gras. So that's kind of all I have for that. But I can jump into king cake. So the name king cake or gato hua comes from the biblical story of the three kings who bring gifts to baby Jesus. A blend of coffee cake and cinnamon roll, king cake is usually iced in yellow, green, and purple colors specifically. Those are the official colors of Mardi Gras. And royal colors of purple signifies justice, green signifies growth, and gold means prosperity and wealth. Those colors can be seen uh, as chosen to resemble a jeweled crown for honoring those three wise men and their gifts during the visit to the Christ child on Epiphany. We love facts here. So uh, Yeah, that's really cool. I had no idea. Well, one, I didn't know what the colors even meant. Yes. So that's cool. Yes. And I never made the connection. And you know why they hide a little tiny baby in the cake? Because King Jesus. Cake. Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's kind of the answer for everything. Yeah. If you are if you grew up in the church and you go to summer camp, the answer is usually Jesus to any of the questions they ask. But in this case, actually, that's the answer. <laughs> <laughs> that makes so much more sense to me. But yeah, so it's that's kind of fun. But basically, king cake is literally a giant cinnamon roll. As I said, a blend of coffee cake and cinnamon roll, kind of if they had a weird baby together. It's yeasted enriched dough. And it can be filled with fruit fillings and cream cheeses. And as I said, hidden within these treats are also usually a special surprise, either, like I said, a baby or sometimes a crown. And whoever finds that item is declared king for a day. And they must either bring the next cake or throw a party for the next season and that kind of sparks an unending round of food and fun and oh you found the baby oh next year you got it you got to do it next time being an antisocial person i I would stress out and not want to find the baby yeah yeah (laughs) whether it's at the workplace school or home king cake is a gift that keeps on giving throughout the mardi gras season and i only specified new orleans just because that's kind of where king cakes come from But yeah, it's a really fascinating sort of topic. If you're interested in learning more, the internet has lots of resources and YouTube videos. So we can jump into the kitchen now, if you would like. Okay. Let's head on into the kitchen and talk about the key cake that we're going to be making. So today I'm going to be using a recipe from Preppy Kitchen. I know there is a lot of recipes from New Orleans. A lot of those that I found were filled and I don't like cream cheese filling. 
Sorry. Sorry. It's my recipe. I make what I want. If I made it with cream cheese, I wouldn't want to eat it. So it'd be all mine. I mean, yeah, you'd eat that entire cake and it is a (laughs) large cake. So I made it so I would want to eat it too. And we can share it with other people. This one is your base traditional filled with just cinnamon and sugar and butter, sort of a la a cinnamon roll. So to start with, you're going to need three and a quarter, two, three and a half cups of all-purpose flour, one third cup granulated sugar, one packet of instant yeast, one teaspoon of salt, a quarter teaspoon of grated nutmeg. You can also use pre-ground nutmeg half a cup of warm milk, and you're going to heat that to 110 to 120 degrees Fahrenheit, half a cup of unsalted butter, also melted, three large eggs at room temperature, and half a teaspoon of vanilla extract. For the filling, you're going to need three quarters of a cup of light brown sugar, firmly packed, firmly grasp it, (laughs) sorry, (laughs) two teaspoons of ground cinnamon, firmly grasp it, firmly grasp it. Four tablespoons unsalted butter, melted, again. And onto the icing, you're going to need one and a quarter cup of powdered sugar, two tablespoons of milk, some milk, (laughs) half a teaspoon of vanilla extract, and those royal colors, green, purple, and yellow, sanding sugar, or sprinkles, whatever you can find for the dough. Step one. In the bowl of a standing mixer, you're going to whisk together flour, sugar, yeast, salt, and nutmeg. Add the milk, the butter, the eggs, and the vanilla, making sure those are all warm. And using your dough hook attachment, mix on medium-low speed until a smooth and sticky dough forms. About 15 minutes, scraping down the bowl as needed. The dough will be loose like stretchy cake batter. It should feel tacky, but not stick to a clean finger when you touch it. And if it's still sticky, you can add the remaining fourth of a cup of flour uh, after that 15-minute beating time. Scrape the dough down into your bowl, cover, let it rise in a warm spot until doubled in size, about one hour. Step two. On a lightly floured work service, turn out your risen dough. Roll and stretch the dough onto a 10 by 20 inch rectangle. Let it rest while you make the filling. For the filling, step one. <laughs> what? So you're saying it's funny. I am in a mood today. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> For the filling, step one. In a small bowl, combine brown sugar, cinnamon, and butter, stirring until well combined. Spread the filling over the dough, leaving half an inch border on one long side. Starting at the long side, opposite the border, tightly roll up the dough into a log, pinching the seam to seal it. He did note in his video that you need to pinch that, pinch it good. Make sure it's closed. Otherwise, it'll pop open. Roll seam side down. Transfer to a piece of parchment paper. Bring the two ends together to form a circular wreath-like shape and pinch those ends again to close that circle. Step three, place the wreath with parchment paper on a rimmed baking sheet, reshaping the wreath into a circle if needed. With scissors, cut the edge of the dough to allow expansion and prevent cracking as the dough rises. Loosely cover and let rise until doubled in size between 45 minutes to one hour. Uh, Step four, while rising, preheat the oven to 350 degrees Fahrenheit. When risen, use a sharp knife or kitchen shears to make cuts about a third of the way through, spaced one inch apart all around the outside of the dough ring to ensure that all the moisture can escape from there and not explode whilst in the oven. Step six, uncover and bake for 25 to 30 minutes or until golden brown. Let cool completely in the pan, transfer to a serving platter. And next you're going to apply your icing. In a small bowl, whisk together confectionery sugar and milk until thick, but spoonable. Spoon over the top of the cake using the spoon to cover the top and push the icing to slightly drip down the sides in a lovely, pleasing manner. Decorate with alternating sections of green, purple, and yellow sugars. We also have some small plastic babies that I will be putting somewhere in the cake. We're back. (laughs) 
in Rave or Roast. All right. Well, since this is your episode this week, do you want to go first? Sure. Excellent recipe, John from Preppy Kitchen. Um, 10 out of 10. He had a video to go along with it, which I appreciate. I, I don't know if it's a millennial thing or I'm just insane, but I need the written, but I also need a video. Otherwise, I'm up to my own interpretation about what certain things mean. So I need to be shown like a baby. <laughs> so <laughs> this was helpful. He had it written. He had a video. He did slightly say something in the written that he did not do in the video. So I was a little confused by that. I think you should when you're making your wreath. That was when you're assembling before you bake it. When you're assembling it, I think you should maybe cut a release hole like down at the bottom. Not a release hole, but what would you call that? Like a vent. I have no idea because I frankly don't understand what he was getting at. It sounded like you score a loaf of sourdough bread Mm -hmm. when you bake it. Right. It sounded like he meant to do that at the bottom. Right. And then he, but he had these cut holes at the top, but we still had some splits in the bottom of the dough. So that's why I'm thinking like maybe we should have scored the bottom. He meant like score the bottom. Yeah. I just don't know how that would have helped at all. So I, I don't know. Maybe somebody can tell us, but. Anyway, if anybody has made a king cake and you've had this similar splitting issue, please let me know how to fix that. But aside from that, it was a great recipe. Very easy. Very simple. Uh, I think I'll give this like a nine and a half out of 10. It was good. A little on the sweet side for me. I still don't like cream cheese. I understand uh, the allure of it, that that could cut through the sweetness of all that sugar and cinnamon. So like, I understand the concept. I'm still not going to like it. But I'm thinking, I'm just trying to think of what else I could put in there besides cream cheese to maybe cut that. Uh, So I'm going to noodle on that for a little bit. But I'm thinking it was a a scoosh sweet for my taste. You definitely needed some milk after you had a bite. (laughs) Um, But I I mean, I think it was baked fine. I don't think I messed up on the actual like baking portion. So, yeah. What do you think, honey? Uh, I agree. I think that's a, I would give it a nine and a half. That's That's a nine nine and a half. half. Gosh, the look he gave me, I was like, <laughs> he's either going to fart or he's trying to signal me to do something. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think it was a nine and a half. Um, I like the cinnamon there. I think it gives it some nice warmth. I thought you did a great job baking it and proving it. It doubled in size both times like it was supposed to. Um, it had some nice layers that were rolled like a cinnamon roll and you had a nice tight spiral to it so you didn't have like huge air pockets except for the spots where you had sliced things but that was on purpose right he told me to do that right um so that was by design and um yeah i thought it turned out great it was tasty i do agree it's like pretty on the sweet side without having um that kind of sour element to help cut down some of the sweetness mm. like a cream cheese would provide Mm. But again, this is traditional. If we're hearkening back to like traditional OG king cake, mm-hmm. this is it. Sure. But um, I think this is actually the first king cake I had. You mentioned that some of the others you've had before, especially from grocery stores, are usually dry or don't have great icing or not enough icing. All um, of the above and just generically sad. And looks kind of like somebody sat on it accidentally in transit. I'm like, how'd you, <laughs> how did you sit on this? Like, why is it so flat? Yeah. So I've never had it from a bakery now. So can't speak to that. But this one looks infinitesimally better than like a generic grocery store bought. Yeah. No offense to grocery stores. Just saying that this one, I mean, it is fresher, most likely. And it just had more rise to it what? and a better icing. Yeah, I mean, it's we made it today, so it's definitely fresher. Um, I don't know when they make it. I don't know how long <laughs> they sit in there. That's the other thing. You don't know how long they've been sitting there. Yeah, I don't know. So anyway, um, yeah, and it came out a nice um, soft bread, moist, not dry, and it was tasty. Mm-hmm. And I'm looking forward to when I can have more. 
Woohoo. Maybe so, for dessert later. <laughs> yeah. Or breakfast. You feel like that's something you could almost have for breakfast because it's so close to a cinnamon roll. I mean, I don't know. Maybe with a coffee, perhaps. It's like a coffee cake had a baby with a cinnamon roll. So maybe a coffee could give you that. Yeah, I think that with coffee would be that pretty good. I like it. And yeah, if you want to see how it turned out or a little video of our baking process, definitely go check out our Instagram where we share all of our pictures and videos of us cooking the food on our Instagram. At who ate it first. Yeah. Um, <laughs> mostly is proof that we're not just BSing you and that we really are doing the I, baking side of things. Oh my gosh. Wouldn't that be funny? We just, just lied. made a podcast and was like, oh, that's so good. And now <laughs> we're cooking it. Just kidding. We're not. LOL. No, oh. we are. I literally have a steam burn from a couple weeks ago. <laughs> I literally bought a package of tiny king cake babies and uh, some more Mardi Gras beads just so I could take some pictures. <laughs> Which we're currently wearing the Mardi Gras beads. Too. I'm wearing a couple too. Yes. <laughs> I mean, it was on sale on Amazon. So, you know, why not? Right. Mm hmm. I think that bow wraps it up, right? Mm-hmm. Nine and a half both ways. What? <laughs> what did you say? Nine and a half both ways. Nine and a half both ways. I don't ways. really like that sentence. <laughs> we both gave it a nine and a half out of ten. <laughs> All right. Thank you for tuning in to Who Ate It First. If you like our podcast, please help us out by following our Instagram account at Who Ate It First to see some behind the scenes pictures or by leaving us a review on your preferred podcast platform, Apple Podcasts right now, please, so Kendall can bite into a lemon like it's an apple. Also, we'd love to hear from you. If you have a food you'd like us to do an episode on, pictures of your attempts to recreate the same dishes we've covered, or a funny food story you'd like to share with us, then email us at whoateitfirst at gmail.com. We might share it in one of our future episodes or on our Instagram. Once again, I am Logan Runquist. And I'm Kendall Runquist. It has been delicious. And King Kiki. <laughs> Bye. Bye.